Hey friends. Today we're going to get into alignment refinement. And we're going to use the Light Warriors United basic sequence to help model it. We'll focus today on just the warm up and we'll explore the nuances of these basic warm up postures and learn how we can maximize the benefits of these poses. We can actually take level one postures and just through internal energetics, transform them into advanced postures. It's a pretty awesome and super engaging experience. So let's get started. Make your way into the downward facing dog. Whew. Okay. So go ahead and feel your body in space here. And then make a few fidgets. Just notice what your body calls for and let the body lead. If you are in the habit of doing a certain routine every time you get into your down dog, this time be a little bit more present with that routine. Notice what that routine does for you. What are you getting out of it? So for me, I love to draw my hips to one side and the other and feel my outer shoulder side body and hip stretch. I get tight in the side body. What do you like to do? And then come back to a neutral down dog. The feet can be hip width apart or they can be together. Hip width apart tends to be more preferred it's more spaciousness for the low back. And the heels disappear behind the ankles. The head and neck are relaxed. The heels are drawing to, but not necessarily touching the floor. They're just drawing down. The knees can be bent if the hamstrings are quite tight, but the thighs are thinking of pressing back. Reach the hips back to the best of your ability. Good enough is good enough. Keep your head and neck relaxed, but shift your awareness to your hands. The base of the index finger grounds. So that's the knuckle that connects the finger to the palm. The base of the index finger presses down. And the base of the middle, ring, pinky, they all press down, thumb, that webbing between the thumb and index finger press down. And feel the energy move to your fingertips and press the fingertips down more. The energy at the base of the wrist is slightly lifted. It may not literally pick up in space, but in your mind you're imagining a millimeter of space right at that tiny arch between your thumb and pinky side of your wrist. If some of these notes are hard for you to feel in your body right now, just trust whatever sticks. Know that confusion is part of the learning process and make peace with it. Breathe. Keep the energy in your hands. Now we're going to add some extra layers for my more advanced folks. If you can't access these directions, don't worry about it. Think of the inner arches of the feet lifting up. So it's like a suction cup of energy. That in inner ankle bone lifts slightly. And then the outer ankle bone hugs in as the inner thighs engage. So energetically, think of the feet hugging to the midline. Energetically, think of the palms hugging to the midline. They don't literally move because the sticky mat is holding your hands in space. But energetically, you feel the palms drawing toward each other. And consequently, you feel the arms, the biceps engaging. Okay, so tighter folks, all you'll want to think of is moving the chest 
So people who are really tight may have their shoulders closer to their hands, the knees could be way bent. And all the tighter folks need to think about is moving the chest closer to the thighs and moving the thighs closer to the back of the room. Those who are a little bit more bendy, you'll continue to think of the heels drawing toward the floor. And we also want to feel that the core below the rib cage, the upper belly, is pushing into the body. So we're not sinking in the shoulders, but rather we're pressing the upper belly back. Come on down to your knees and just watch the screen for a moment. So one area of the body that tight or flexible, many yogis tend to lose awareness of, is the area right around the bottom edge of the shoulder blade. There's often a sinking there where the shoulder kind of collapses into its socket and there's weight down into the hands. When the hands are grounded, we want spaciousness in the shoulder joint, especially if one day it might turn into a handstand. And so we practice pushing the floor away to lengthen the shoulders. So I'm not sinking here, I'm pushing the floor away and at the same time, the upper belly, those front ribs, hug into the back body. Now, if you're really tight, you don't need to worry about that, but you still may want to focus on lengthening the shoulders. Bendy folks, those who are really flexible, you can easily touch your heels to the floor and your forehead hits the floor. For you, we want to complement that bendiness with some strength to support so for you, we can practice reaching the tailbone to the knees. Not so much butt up, but tailbone to the knees. And then front ribs in, triceps, upper arms still hugged to the midline, like everybody else. Let's all find our down dog. Inhale, plank pose. So the feet and hands should be the same distance apart in plank pose as they are in down dog. The balls of the feet are underneath the heels, the inner thighs hug to the midline, the belly lifts, and place your knees down. Okay. We're going to do some cat cows now. This is a nice way to bring rhythm to the breath and coordinate that rhythm with the body. So linking breath to body and creating almost like a hypnotic trance that brings us further into the depth of our practice. The inhale drops the belly, lift the chest and butt. Exhale, round the back. Use the inhales, go ahead, inhale to maximize the stretch, so really breathe in, lift up, and then use the exhale to maximize the stretch in the other direction. Round your back, push the belly out, push more air out. Continue a few more here. Inhaling, dropping the belly, and exhale, round the back. Go ahead, find a rhythm that works for you. and pause in the center. In this position, have your index fingers pointing forward. So we're not turning the hands in. For the sake of this class, and in general, the index fingers point straight ahead. This helps turn the shoulder into more of an external rotation. When the middle finger points ahead, it can lead to the elbows bending sideways, especially when we make our way into chaturanga. So turning the hands out ever so slightly, just index fingers forward, helps keep the elbows hugging in for postures that will come. In this position, you also want to feel that same work we did in down dog. So a lot of these alignment notes are quite consistent. The base of the index finger is grounding, most and the webbing there and the weight is moving forward into the fingertips. 
on my hands and knees position. My shoulders are not stacked over the back of the wrist because that would more likely cause the inner part of my wrist and the index finger here, that knuckle, tends to curl up, especially in postures like up dog. So we're setting a precedent of pressing that down and oftentimes we'll have to remind ourselves of that over and over before it becomes just the way our body moves. So the hands are stacked underneath the shoulders, the palms more so than the wrists. And then in this position, we don't want to be hanging in our shoulders. Push the floor away and have that spaciousness that we talked about in down dog. And then from here, extend the right leg back. This is option one. We're going to go through various levels and you can stop wherever feels best for you. Two is lifting the leg. Now lifting the leg often happens when the belly drops and the butt engages. We want to feel the front of our pelvis is lifting. So there is a sensation, you can come to a kneeling position like me, that instead of having the leg go back and the belly forward, we want to feel the front of the pelvis lifting up toward the belly button. So the tailbone drops down. Now we're not over tucking. Over tucking the tailbone can lead to low back pain. Any direction I offer, do about 90%, maybe 80. We don't want to push so hard um, our idea of what we're supposed to be doing onto our body that the body doesn't have space to tell us if something isn't quite right for us. Yoga is a chill activity. I mean, it's, it's vigorous, but at the same time, even in the vigor, there's a level of ease to it. So only give about 80 to 90%. Leave the rest to feel the feedback your body's giving you instead of demanding too much of yourself that you're not able to listen to your body's wisdom. So there's that lifting at the front of the pelvis, not a tucking. Come back to your hands and knees. The leg extends back and then lifts up and we're feeling the low belly pulling in toward the upper belly. So it's not so much about lifting the back leg high the foot is hip height. It's about lifting the low belly. If this is going well, we can extend the left arm forward. If this still feels good, we can reach the arm all the way forward. Turn the palm to face the midline, and then come on down for a sec. One of the reasons why we turn the palms to the midline in warrior one, in crescent pose, in chair pose, is it helps have the shoulders in what's called external rotation. In yoga, we call it external rotation, where the tricep hugs in. This is useful for handstand and other arm balances. So we want to feel that the shoulder is fairly consistently lengthened and hugging in. When the arm is in this position, the shoulder blades are spread and lifted. This enables us to have more space in the shoulder joint, which means it can handle more pressure. So go ahead, leg back and up, fingertips forward and up, tricep hugs in. So palm faces midline. All right, from here, if you still have it in you, exhale, knee to elbow, round the back. Inhale, extend that stable position. Exhale, pull it in. Inhale, reach. Exhale, reach. Last one. Notice what your right shoulder is doing. Keep it lengthened and reach and place the hand and knee down. Good. Turn your right palm to face the ceiling. So turn it upside down. If you're a little bit tighter, you may want to have the fingertips pointing to the midline. More bendy people, you can have the fingertips pointing toward the knees. We stretch for three, two, and release. Let's do the second side. I'm not going to say as much at first. You feel your body. See if you can recall what I'm offering, and then I'll speak. Go ahead. Level one, leg back. Level two leg up. 
find the appropriate engagement to maximize the benefits of this post. What's going on in the belly? It's lifting as the thigh hollows. Now, extend the right fingertips forward. Maybe lift the arm up. Having our eyes at one spot beneath the eye sockets, maybe slightly forward, helps with balance. Feel the belly engaged. Feel length through the tricep, hugging in and fingertips reaching away. Notice what's happening in the left hand. Is that left index finger knuckle bubbling up? Mine did. I'm going to remember to press it down. Is my shoulder sinking? I'm going to push out. And then exhale, knee to elbow. And extend. Exhale, two. And extend. Keep going. Do the work we did in the cat-cow. As you exhale, round the back. And keep the core engaged. Okay. Place your hand and knee back down. Turn your left palm to face the ceiling and stretch the left wrist. And release. We're now going to discuss three options you have in plank pose. Now, for students with frontal shoulder injuries or people who are newer to moving their bodies, we're going to do what's called a retracted shoulder. So in this position, plank, rather than pushing out as much, we're going to draw the shoulder blades together. Now, I rarely teach this because most of my practitioners have been moving for a while or they um, come from an athletic background where they already have plank pose in their body with the shoulders somewhat pushed out. But for newer folks who don't have the strength to push out, we can practice hugging in so the shoulder blades draw together. This also helps create more space at the front of the shoulder for anyone who might have frontal shoulder injury. So in plank pose, we'll have the shoulder blades drawn together, the belly is still lifted, the feet can be hip width apart still. Inner thighs still hug in like down dog. Energetics of the hands are consistent. Draw the tailbone toward the knees so it's not tucking the tailbone. And then place your knees down. So that's one option. That's the shoulder blades drawing together. The next option that we have, which I prefer, is having the shoulders in neutral. So naturally, the shoulder blades for most of us lift off the back about a half an inch. I like to keep that consistent in my plank pose. So there's a slight lift of the shoulder blades, not completely retracted, not completely spread, but just a more neutral shape. And the energetics would be, the rest is the same. Inner thighs hug in, low belly lifts. The benefit of this more neutral shape and the next, the protracted shoulders. So retract is together, neutral is neutral, protract is spread. Gymnasts love to protract. I found it doesn't feel the best on my shoulders and I have had um, pain at the front of my shoulder from doing too much protraction. So I tend not to do that, but most yogis who are arm balance enthusiasts prefer the protracted position. Everybody's body is different though. So now you know. One of the amazing benefits of learning is we become more open to possibilities. We don't know what we don't know. So we might be just practicing plank pose without an awareness that we have a shoulder blade that moves in different positions and we have a choice on how we situate it. It's amazing. All right, so go ahead and set yourself up. We're going to start in hands and knees and have your index fingers pointing forward, which naturally hugs the triceps in. Ground the base of your index finger and the webbing between the index finger and thumb. Feel the rest of the knuckles connect and press the fingertips down. 
Step the feet back in plank pose. Try the retracted. Try the protracted. It feels like crow pose. And then find something in the middle. In each position, the chest is extending forward and your upper belly is hugging to the back body. We'll hold here for another three, two, okay. Very nice. Roll out your wrists. When I'm teaching, I love to offer some core work before going from plank to chaturanga. That's hence the knee to elbow work and the cross diagonal work in the core. The lower from plank to chaturanga tends to cause the core to drop. Remember how in down dog we said we want to keep those front ribs hugging in? We do want to keep that in plank to the best of our ability and we want to keep it when we're lowering to chaturanga. It's hard though, it's much harder in the lower to chaturanga. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off, go ahead, make your way into plank pose, and then place your knees down. Lowering from plank to chaturanga on the knees for now is just going to give us an opportunity to feel our body with greater clarity. So without the muscular strain, we're going to have um, more ability to see what's happening in the system as we'll have more freed energy. So from this position, a rookie mistake is the elbows bend backward or the elbows bend sideways. Instead, lengthen the low back by reaching the tailbone toward the knees, not over tucking, but somewhat. Keep the elbows mostly stacked over the wrists. And then from this position, the chest goes forward. Elbows continue to hug in. And then push up. Okay, so doing chaturanga with the knees down is so valuable for so many. Uh, so there's no, and we want to make sure that as we're teaching and practicing, we don't, um, judge the postures in any way. Yoga is not a competitive sport. You get to do any variation that you want and you get to enjoy your body while you do it. There's no goal, there's no needs to happen. You don't get a bonus from your boss if you do a more advanced looking chaturanga. To me, the most advanced practitioner is the one that knows the shape that's most appropriate for their body more so than the one that can do the fanciest poses. It's a, it's a yogi who is more wholly connected to themselves and is building their practice in a way that's sustainable. All right, so let's, and reflect self-awareness. Next, we're gonna practice tall chaturanga. I love tall chaturanga. I can demonstrate for you before you get into it. So from my plank pose, rather than feeling the pressure of going all the way to that elbow height position, I can just bend my elbows a little bit and maintain perhaps the spreading. If I wanted to keep my shoulder blades spread, it's easier to do that in the tall chaturanga and it's much easier to feel the upper belly hugging to the back body. I quite like chaturanga and the transition into up dog from the tall chaturanga is quite simple as well. It doesn't change things much at all, but from here, keeping everything engaged. And we'll talk about the up dog transition in a moment. Okay? So let's give that tall chaturanga a try. Go ahead, place your palms down. Recall the orientation. Recall the hands hugging in. Recall the grounding of the base of your index finger. Make your choice in the shoulder blades and do your best to keep it consistent as you lower. Go ahead, take your tall chaturanga and we hold. Hold, chest forward, elbows mostly over wrists, upper belly back, low belly, hollows, hold, hold, okay. Woo! Strong, yes. All right, so what's next? Hmm, hmm, hmm. I guess we'll go for the full chaturanga now. All right, if your wrists are feeling sensitive, then you may want to sit this one out or after a little stretch, a little shake, you're ready for it. Shall we? 
You can also, you're welcome to place your knees down. Let's go ahead. Find your, chatter, your plank pose. Belly is lifting. Inner thighs of your legs hug to the midline. Shoulders stack over palms. Elbows remain mostly over the wrists. Chest goes forward. Elbows bend. Keep the belly lifting for five, four, three, two, and whoo. All right, lay down. Nice work. <sighs> Who knew? So many layers happening within each pose. Those triceps hugging in really make an awesome difference in the engagement in the biceps. All right, next we're gonna work on up dog. Okay, in up dog, common mistakes I see is the wrists are in front of the shoulders and that index finger knuckle curls up. Also, the shoulders come up by the ears and the low belly collapses. We're gonna do our best to feel that the hands are still pushing the floor away. So like in down dog where we push our hands into the floor and the shoulders get long, in up dog, we push the floor away and the center of the chest lifts up. The shoulders are over the palms like they were in plank. The feet can be hip width apart. Often also I'll see students have their ankles fall falling to the side. Keep the outer ankles hugging in. And there is a contraction between the inner thighs. So the outer hips hug to the midline as the inner thighs are engaged. So here I am. You can join me now. Let's, uh, let's go from plank pose. So go ahead, make your way into plank pose. And then place the top of your right foot and the top of your left foot down. Lower the hips. Push the floor away and feel the belly is still lifting. Hollow the belly for three, two. All right, place your knees down. Place the tops of your hands on the thighs to stretch the wrists. So up dog itself is a pose that is fairly accessible for most people. We do want the knees off the floor, but if they're grounded, that's fine. The hips, we would very much like the off of the floor. So that's a difference between up dog and a different pose. Having the hips off of the floor helps keep the low back longer. So when the low back, when the hips are on the floor, there's more compression right here in the low back, the, where the lumbar spine and the uh, sacral spine meet. So your sacrum is the flat part of your spine um, or the fused part of your spine where the bones are together closer to the tailbone. And then above that, we have the lumbar spine, and we want to make sure that there's not compression there. So one way to prevent compression is through core engagement. To clarify that, let's practice it in Sphinx pose. Give the wrists a little bit of a break here. Sphinx pose is another great prep pose for up dog. I often like to do some back bending before up dog uh, because especially in beginner classes, it can be a bigger back bend. So Sphinx pose or those cat cows are great precursors to the up dog. Elbows underneath the shoulders, tops of the feet press down, low belly lifts, elbows press down, chest lifts. The tops of the shoulders lean back. Now, feel what happens when you drop the low belly and feel what happens when you engage the core. So resist the low belly from the floor as much as possible. And now add the layer of the tops of the feet pushing down. That helps activate the front body and engage the core and lengthen the spine. Simultaneously press the elbows down and tilt the tops of the shoulders back. Ah, yeah, so belly is engaged, but not causing the chest to round. In opposition, 
but in synergy, the tops of the shoulders lean back. Okay, so let's bring that work to up dog. Hands by the sides of the rib cage, tops of the feet push down, up dog, chest forward and up. And then from the low belly, hips up and back, down dog. So we want to feel that push to down dog coming from the low belly. Let's do that and then we'll discuss the chaturanga to up dog. So make your up dog shape. Put your mind on the low belly. Exhale. Feel the tips of the toes come to the floor and then roll over the feet. Many people like to step their feet in a little bit. Just be careful not to step the feet in too much. We want to have that down dog, once again, the same length as your plank pose, hands to feet. Okay, and then sit down. We'll talk about the transition now from chaturanga to up dog. There are three main ways that it can happen. The first is the flip flip. This one tends to be a favorite, and it's the most accessible. So here I am, I did my tall chaturanga say. Top of my right foot, top of my left foot, chest forward and up, up dog. That's all. Yeah, flip, flip. Simple, clear, good. Okay, what we want to avoid is going from here and then just flipping the feet over because then our shoulders end up too far forward. Or sometimes students are in their plank, they kind of collapse to the floor, and then they push their chest back for up dog without doing any form of chaturanga. That can lead to compression in the low back here as the shoulders are behind the wrists and I'm pushing my body into a deeper back bend. Also with the shoulders behind the wrists, we leave the wrists vulnerable to more compression because it's harder to move the weight forward in the hand into the fingers. But remember, since that down dog, we're always trying to keep this guy slightly lifted. Next option. So here I am, tall chaturanga, knees down, tops of feet down, chest forward and up, knees up. This is actually my preferred way of transitioning. I'll show one more time. Plank pose, bend the elbows, knees down, tops of feet down, chest forward and up, up dog. Now last, we have the Ashtanga variation that has a kind of a push-pull energy in the feet. So watch my feet and see what happens. From plank, chaturanga, I push the toes back and then pull them forward so my shoulders remain stacked over the palms. I don't love this one because I have dry skin and I find that when I practice this, the, my big toe starts to peel. So to keep my skin intact, I like to do option number two, but this one's a little bit cooler. Um, and there's that burst of energy back with the feet before they pull forward. Demonstrate again. Plank pose, lower, Push, pull. Go ahead, play around with it. It may take a few tries to get the hang of it. Play, play yoga with me. You got this. Last little bit. Okay and take a child's pose. Arms can rest by your hips, forehead down. One of the things that we experience in yoga is that it's not what we do. It's the energy that we bring to what we do that creates the experience. The more we engage with our body in the present moment, the more options become available to us. 
And so I encourage you, whenever you feel confused or stuck in life, rather than running to an outside source for inspiration, which that can happen down the line, but maybe at first take a pause. See if you can plug into what's happening right now. And then with curiosity and openness, see if you can become available to another pathway forward. We don't know what we don't know, but by becoming still and present and open, we may surprise ourselves with what we're capable of discovering. Take a larger inhale through your nose and exhale out your mouth. Go ahead and pick your forehead up. My spirit honors your spirit. Namaste.